Good morning, afternoon, or evening to all of those tuning into this virtual session from every corner of the world. My name is Nick Westray, and today I have the pleasure of introducing you to our speaker, Dr. Brian Schiff, and moderating the Q&A session that will follow this talk. But first, I would like to welcome you to the opening day of this very important virtual conference. In times like these, organizing a conference is no small task. And so, I would like to thank the organizing committee for their commitment to ensuring that we are having meaningful dialogue about the crisis we collectively face within the crisis that we collectively face. Now, to the topic at hand, it is my tremendous, tremendous pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Brian Schiff. Brian Schiff is Chair and Professor in the Department of Psychology at the American University of Paris and Director of the George and Irina Schaefer uh, Center for the Study of Genocide, Human Rights, and Conflict Prevention. Dr. Schiff completed his PhD at the University of Chicago's Committee on Human Development in 1997 and joined the American University of Paris in 2007. Dr. Schiff is author and editor of many books, including A New Narrative for Psychology and Life and Narrative, The Risks and Responsibilities of Storing Experience. In 2016, Dr. Schiff was given the Theodore Sarbin Award from the American Psychological Association's Division 24. Today, Dr. Schiff will present a talk called The Hermeneutics of Crisis and the Crisis of Interpretation. In this talk, Dr. Schiff will engage our contemporary moment, the COVID moment, as a crisis in interpretation that demands we address the question, what is going on here? With great anticipation, I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Schiff. And within five minutes of the conclusion of this talk, Dr. Schiff and I will meet you for a real-time Q&A session in the Zoom meeting that's associated with this talk. Please come with your questions and comments for discussion, and I will provide further instructions when we see you there. So I'd like to start just first by saying thank you uh, for inviting me to talk uh, at this virtual conference. Uh, and I wanted to also say that AUP and the psychology department at AUP that were very pleased to be hosting this virtual event, um, at, which is extremely innovative, timely, and a critically important discussion for us. And I just wanted to thank the scientific committee uh, in general, but also to, to, to just thank Martin Dege, uh, for his hard work uh, and effort. He's assistant professor at AUP and uh, as well Maria Medved, uh, professor um, at AUP, both on the scientific committee, um, as well as Irina Strasser, uh, who uh, is now assistant professor at the American University of Cairo, um, but uh, one of our colleagues here at the American University of Paris last year teaching here. So in many ways, this is, this is quite a strange talk to deliver. And, and I'm not only talking here about the digital format. As a signpost of this historical moment, this talk feels acutely in the present moment. And because of that, a work in progress. Perhaps that's how it should be a recognition of the natural or everyday way that persons, alone and together, negotiate and make sense of the world. I'm going to begin with talking about René Magritte's painting, um, surrealist painter, uh, Les Amants, uh, from 1928, or translated into English as the lovers, two figures draped or masked, subtle markers of gender engaged in a kiss, perhaps even a passionate one. It's a well-known painting, and I'm sure that there are many people who are familiar with it. A few months ago, I might have spoken about this painting in terms of identity, intimacy, mystery of love, passion, about truly knowing another person. Then at that moment, if I was in conversation with someone, they might articulate other interpretations that might, 
in their turn influence, or perhaps not, my understanding of the painting. Obviously, the reason why I'm talking about Magritte in this context is because for me, and I imagine for others, the meanings and associations have changed. Although the older interpretations are still accessible, I see something new in the painting that wasn't there months ago. I see things about masks and germs, distance, separation, the meaning of physical touch. I also think about the strange way that my body now maneuvers around other people on the street. I think about innovative new words like social distancing and the elbow bumps that have replaced kisses and the revised meaning of intimacy. Be careful, not so close. Stop, think before you kiss. Now there are ways that the painting, both wittingly and unwittingly, has been recontextualized. I see it represented in different forms, some deliberately so, such as what I'm now showing on the PowerPoint, which is a tweet from Claire at Classy Bridges, um, responding to the Getty Museum's challenge to create great works of art using, as you can see, uh, using just three objects or people in their homes. But other recontextualizations, perhaps, but I don't know, are just in my interpretive resourcefulness. This painting, um, or this uh, street art painting, uh, is done by Pobo, um, put up in March of 2020. The Lovers, right? Uh, also to perhaps, who knows, recalling Magritte's painting from almost 100 years back. Les Amants, or The Lovers, enters into new relationships, capable of new interpretations. And one last wrinkle, um, I've referenced Magritte's lovers in our conversation about COVID. To what effect on our story? So unfortunately, this talk is not about painting, and it's not about love, rather, I'm going to talk about the process of drafting shared interpretations in the midst of the dramatic changes that we've experienced. Although not everything has changed, many aspects of our lives have, suddenly. Our day-to-day -day routines, plans, work if we still have a job, priorities, our bodies, our very faces the world, the future. All of these things, they disclose themselves in their strangeness, in their seeming brokenness to each and every one of us, but also as members of groups, as collectivities. The discursive construction, COVID crisis, COVID-19, corona, has presented us not only with a public health emergency, but also with a crisis of interpretation. Indeed, what exactly is going on? What does it mean? Our ongoing dialogue with the events of the day encountered in media and interacting with others, striving to make sense of uncomfortable and pressing questions. Where am I? When will it end? What will be the future? And why is this happening to us? This is the interpretive crisis, which demands innovative strategies for sense-making. 
or what Hilda Lindemann Nelson calls narrative repair. It's critical to emphasize that although the COVID-19 situation is different, so is every other situation. And the response, the necessity for interpretive repair really isn't something new or all that different, but a familiar feature of our day-to-day -day lives. Perhaps it's most apparent when facing loss, separation, illness, or war, but still every day and normal. I also have a sense that living through this experience can help to clarify in more concrete and descriptive terms something fun fundamental about social life. That is, our everyday ongoing engagement making sense of experience, others, and the world, collectively, together with others. It's this process of interpretation that will be the central focus of my talk. And in particular, I'm going to focus on interpretations made on what can be thought of as the social plane of analysis. That is, commonly held interpretations, or better, potentially common. In other words, I'm going to set my sights on describing what's referred to as social or collective memory, but at times, of course, has gone by other names. Social representations, intersubjectivity, historical consciousness, myth, mentalité, master narratives. But I'm going to reorient the conceptual vocabulary to the language of narrative, rather than speaking about social or collective memory, that is. Which does, when we, when we do this, when we reorient things toward narrative, it does have some productive and interesting effects. I'm going to frame shared interpretations descriptively and I hope evocatively, as stories in the making. I'll close with a reflection on stories in the making in the present COVID moment. The problem of how groups assemble around common, more or less consensual understandings of the past, but let's not leave up here, let's not leave out here the present and the future, is best served by analyzing and describing what's actually happening on the ground in the articulation and exchange of interpretations. Indeed, there is no magic in this and no need to mystify or reify the process. As Sarah Gensberger writes, it may now be possible to avoid the reification of collective memory. Instead of studying production, reception, it is now possible to examine the process by which memory exists relationally and through social interactions, evolving through continual and reciprocal dialogue between social individuals. But it, does not, it, but it does require that we focus on multiple levels of analysis simultaneously, by no means easy. And importantly, that we do so using a vocabulary suited to the task. Again, I believe that the conceptual vocabulary of narrative is particularly well suited. Stories in the Making attempts to describe the movement and circulation of interpretations as an ongoing process mediated through semiotic forms or what Jim Virch calls mediational means, mainly linguistic and narrative, but also images and spaces 
as they become taken for granted, natural, and even affect infused. Certainly, the past, or what the Osmans call cultural memory, is part of the story, supplying accessible reference, cultural frames, storylines, and schemas. As Michael Rothberg writes, memory is an anachronistic quality. It's bringing together of now and then, here and there, is actually the source of powerful creativity. Its ability to build new worlds out of the materials of others. Rothberg rightly argues that cross-referencing is key to the interpretive process. Referencing or relationality found in all story practices is likewise inherent to all meaning-making activities. Built from the gathering of elements into a rapport, drafting a relationship, an emerging direction or potential plotline takes shape. The present moment is always a ready-made referent that can be read backwards in a process that Mark Freeman calls hindsight. Meanings can shift in relation to changes in our lived experience and stage in development. Narrative's overtimeness is crucial. Also, this conversation in the here and now becomes a potential resource that can be referenced in later conversations. The process is dynamic, building from the ground up. As Alexandra Georgia Coppolo writes, all narrative meaning making is seen as contextualized, but also as having the potential to be lifted from its original context and to be recontextualized, that is, to acquire new meanings in new contexts. Historicity and circulation become part of the analysis. And there are a host of resources, not only from the past or from cultural memory, that can be accessed, articulated, and used. Imaginative fantasies, painstaking observations, can play a part in the evolving story. Rather than thinking about this, uh, this process, as, as Ginsberger says, relation, relationality, or Rothberg says, um, referencing or cross-referencing, I prefer to call this resourcefulness, which connotes a sense of agency, but also creativity and imagination, cleverness, skillfulness, even slyness or deviousness, making something with the resources available at hand in order to solve problems with more or less agility. I'm going to suggest something like or similar to Keatley and Pickering. But we can find analogous arguments in the turn to process in memory studies, in Rothberg and Gensberger cited above, but also in Earl and Rigney and others. But I'll avoid the con conceptual problems implicit in the me memory metaphor. Caitlin and Pickering write, popular memory, or which is really their term for social or collective memory that they're using, is not held in the texts, nor is it held by individuals. It is in the discursive space between them that popular memory exists, energized 
by the action of the mnemonic imagination. Popular memory operates through a discursive space in which we remember in common using cultural resources. As they rightly argue, it is the discursive spaces between persons using shared resources together with others that, dis that discursively produces shared interpretations of the past. Indeed, when we start to closely observe what's going on when persons exchange with others, trying to make sense of the past, present, and future, that is, to piece together some story, we observe the articulation or casting of a variety of interpretations made present, intervening in common social space, verbal and nonverbal, reflected upon and non-reflected upon. Of course, such articulations have degrees of fixity in dynamics of authority politeness and power. There are loud and soft voices, distribution, accessibility, and repetition are all considerations in thinking about what gets said and how, by who, when, and where. But that's not all that matters. And if we want to understand shared interpretations, we cannot remain only at the level of social exchange. Indeed, if we stop and notice it, at the same moment that we are engaging with others, and with the stream of interpretations being made present, intervening into social space, we also find interpretations appearing on the phenomenal plane of psychological experience, self-talk. There's a plane of social activity which is interpreted in different ways, refracted and piecemeal in self-talk, and in collaborative storytelling, at least one person, one other person, who likewise, one might suppose, is making interpretations of their own about what is going on, on in the social plane. And perhaps one of us will, will articulate their refracted interpretations into the conversation to amplify, dare I say, retweet, modify, or disavow. Or perhaps to try and resource other meanings and change directions. In other words, there's a complex but fluid and dynamic exchange between the conversation or what's going on in social activity and the sense making that persons are doing psychologically. Bill Hurst and his colleagues have made a provocative argument that psychological processes play a role in collective memory. And in fact, they're one of the few, or perhaps, well, they're one of the few that actually do make this argument and try to connect these two levels of analysis. They argue that cognitive processes fine tune stories over multiple repeated conversations where related information that is not collaboratively remembered is cognitively inhibited or pruned away, producing converging interpretations. As they write, or as Hurst, Komen, and Komen write, the mechanisms of human memory are exquisitely tuned to social influences so that others can shape and reshape memories in a way that promotes the formation of collective memories. 
I find the research compelling and useful. I would like to add by emphasizing the interpretive agency that persons have in two ways. First, persons find positions inside stories in the making. As Michael Bomberg has argued, part of the, part of the work of conversational narratives is for participants to find their place in the evolving conversation. This is most clearly seen in what Bomberg calls positioning level two. As he writes, it is at this level that we ask why a story is told at this particular point in the interaction, or more specifically, why the narrator claims the floor at this particular point in the conversation to tell a story. What is he or she trying to accomplish interactively within the story? In other words, persons take up positions in the story and they carry the conversational thread forward, intervening, amplifying, revising, amending, criticizing, rejecting, or simply ignoring. And they do so because of their investment in identities, positions, and motivations. I just like to add to this that this kind of intervention happens both in social activity and also within self-talk. Second, I'd like to say that persons have the possibility to use their interpretive agency to bring new references and relationships in order to open up the story in the making, making new and different connections and configurations. In other words, persons can be resourceful in order to create divergent storylines. For these reasons, the story in the making is always, as Elliot Mishler writes, a work in progress, forever, as Mark Freeman argues, postponing meaning. The story is always and forever unconditionally unfinished. And I'll let Jens Brockmeyer have the final, the unfinal, excuse me, word on this point. The ongoing interpretability of narrative experiences and memories keeps the entire process open-ended, at least in principle. So what is the emerging story that we're making of COVID? One of the most fascinating aspects of living in this historical moment, the COVID moment, is to see the emergent flux and flow of interpretations into social space. In Time Maps, Evyatar Zerubavel argues that we make sense of the past through a process of implodding social time fabricating a sense of continuity or discontinuity by bridging the past with the present or by tearing down those bridges. He writes, in order to help maintain the illusion of wide historical gaps actually separating different periods from one another, we thus mnemonically inflate the distance between everything that happened prior to the particular watersheds marking their boundary and everything that has happened since. And here on the slide you see from Zerubbabel's time maps, his map of the Western Hemisphere, where obviously the pivotal event that he lengthens out 
is uh, Columbus coming to America or coming to the U.S. Um, as thinking about it as a watershed event from a particular perspective and the distance that it creates from the past and it really puts things into periods, a pre-Columbian period and a, an American period. And as if taking a page directly from Zerubbabel, Thomas Friedman in his New York Times op-ed on March 17th, 2020 writes, there is the world BC before Corona and the world AC after Corona. We have not even fully, we have not even begun to fully grasp what the AC world will look like. Of course, the reference to our calendar marks a dramatic shift in temporality to a time before and a time after, discontinuity in Zerubbabel's terms, or watershed. Of course, this is an instance of resourcefulness by Friedman, using what you got to make something else, which by analogy equates the momentousness of Jesus's life to social time, to the momentousness of COVID to our current social time. But is that really true? It's a question. As we can all witness, there is not one decisive interpretation, one way of understanding the moment, but rather it's ca cacophonic, it's confusing, conflicting, overlapping, abundant with uncertainty, ambiguous. It's almost like entering a room where everyone is talking at the same time, interrupting, talking over one another. The conversation is not stable or convergent. And at moments, it's just been depressing and even wacky and ridiculous. Certainly, there are exacerbating factors in pr producing the cacophony. The lack of coordinated multilateral global leadership that we've gotten accustomed to over the past 70 years. The transatlantic alliance seems to have collapsed. And a new Cold War appears to have broken out, this time between China and the US. Their communication teams, each accusing each other for mishandling the pandemic based on tangential evidence, accusations, and conspiracies. Just as a for instance, on March 25th, after the US Secretary of State insisted on calling the coronavirus the Wuhan virus, the G7 failed to issue a statement on the pandemic. For sure, the intensification of digital technology as a source of information and, communi and communication, exacerbated by prolonged campaigns of disinformation and the questioning of expertise as fake have also taken a profound toll in producing this confusion. Lori Garrett, Pulitzer Prize journalist, former senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, author of the 1995 The Coming Pandemic, Newly Emerging disease, Diseases in a, in a World Out of Balance. Not surprisingly, out of stock on Amazon. And should I dare say it, an expert. Garrett remarks in the Financial Times on May 14th, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, 
has led the response to every disease for decades. Now it has been now it has vanished from view. True enough, in fact, very true and painfully so. But I believe that this might also be, this cacophony might also be due to the fact that this is just the point that we're at in the story. It's still in motion. Not enough facts are known. As the eminent historian of the Holocaust, Raul Hilberg reflects, in the beginning, there was no Holocaust. When it took place in the middle of the 20th century, its nature was not fully grasped. There was a tendency to submerge it in the history of the Second World War, or to treat it as yet another occurrence of the long, in a long progression of anti-Jewish acts, or to view it more generally as the persecu persecution of a minority. It has taken some time to establish the idea that the Holocaust is not reducible to something larger, simpler, or more essential. What Hilberg conveys is the ongoing interpretive process inherent to stories in the making. Because the, whole, the history of the Holocaust is now established, it's hard to imagine a time, perhaps not all that different from ours, when interpretation was not as forthcoming and questions of what exactly is going on reigned. The Holocaust could have been submerged or merged into a long progression of other potential narratives. In other words, put in other relations, into other configurations. Although interpretations have coalesced on the, on the Holocaust, it is still open to reinterpretation and reimagining, as can be seen by, most poignantly, attempts to deny or relativize this history. The story is still in the making. As I argued, this crisis of interpretation, this COVID moment, brings a desire perhaps even a need for narrative repair. But it's better to put aside the evaluative connotation of repair in this context. Indeed, there is an insidious and sometimes maliciously opportunistic way that the conversation on what's going on is strategically employed and framed what my colleague, Alexandra Georgiakopoulou, has called mobilizing stories. And Maria Mekala, Hanna Maratoya, and Mirja Pol Polvinen term instrumental narratives. One of the most disturbing aspects of the current situation is the amplitude of hateful stereotypes and racist images, symbolic violence, if I can slightly modify the concept of Pierre Bourdieu to include the denigration, accusation, and pollution of other groups in symbolic forms. It was first directed at the Chinese. On January 27th, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, I found myself in a Paris taxi when the virus was raging in, in China. And we, or rather I, had no imagination that the wave would reach France. I was surprised and terrified to hear the taxi driver speak about Chinese and Asians as dirty and polluting, contending that the virus was attributable to unsanitary food practices, a moral failing. I was and continue to be amazed 
at how easily and effectively such notions entered the story. This was long before the President of the United States began referring to Corona as the Chinese virus, or reports that the President's staffers referred to COVID by the resourceful and disturbing moniker Kung Flu. Or Asian Americans became the target of hostile taunts or physical violence. But Asians are far from the only group framed as a threat in this context. One of the key elements of what Susan Benesh calls dangerous speech. One of the projects that I'm working on at the moment is an analysis of the manifestos of right-wing mass shooters, right-wing extremists. Not a particularly happy subject. On March 18th, a student at AUP working on this research with me, Michael Justice, sent me the following article. You may or may not trust Vice News as a source, but let me assure you that NGOs who work on hate speech, such as the Southern Poverty Law Center, and the Anti-Defamation League are all publishing reports on the increase of anti-Semitism during the COVID moment. Mixing long-held stereotypes, lies, and conspiracies resourcefully into the COVID plotline. This is just one of the examples. I came across the UK's Community Security Trust who recently published a report, Coronavirus and the Plague of Antisemitism, which documents the diverse and sometimes contradictory ways that antisemitism is weaved into the COVID narrative on social media. But there's an increase of conspiracy theories of all stripes. Literally, their proliferation is far too long to do it any justice. 5G towers, tracking chips and vaccines, and so on. Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, and George Soros are all involved. As persons and groups attempt to utilize the interpretive crisis to serve instrumental goals, as ways of intervening into the story toward desired ends, indeed convictions and motivations that predated the current moment. The question is, what is my position in this unfolding story? And what is yours? What are we going to make of it all? Are we lost? Are we to blame others? Or are we to be in this moment together? Now, I'm not a politician, I'm not a political theorist, but I do feel like I need to end this talk with a couple of words about the direction of the story that are political in nature. I've been surprised and dismayed at how easily our societies, and we, myself included, have succumbed to fear. If this situation is to last longer, which in my opinion is likely, as President Macron has told us, we have to get used to living with the coronavirus. And I would add to regain our footing in the conversation. I'm wondering how it could be that we can recuperate those aspects of our lives that are valuable to us and make life work live, worth living without succumbing to crippling fear. I wonder how it is that we might be resourceful and turn this conversation toward reclaiming and supporting more authentically than before the values that motivate us 
that are precious to us in our private lives, about intimacy and care for others, and are in our social lives as caretakers of the community, of equality, justice, human rights, common good, good, the future of the planet. Of course, we need to engage and criticize symbolic violence, instrumental narratives. But we also need to truly and authentically reimagine our priorities and our lives toward inclusiveness, or what Mika Bal has said or called the value of solidarity. One final note. Finishing this talk, I read portions of two commencement speeches, which I'm sure will get mentioned in this conference, that President Obama gave, virtually, of course, in which he counseled graduates to work together in order to confront, confront the challenges of this pandemic, but also the environment, economic inequality, and healthcare. As quoted in the New York Times on May 16th, if we're going to create a world where everybody has the opportunity to find a job and afford college, if we're going to save the environment and defeat future pandemics, then we're going to have to do it together, he said. So be alive to one another's struggles. For a second, reading his words, I felt a surge. Perhaps there is some openness in the story to other directions. In the same article, May 16th, the New York Times suggested that others as well might be open to this, to new directions. They quoted uh, a graduating senior Ariel Turnley, a 21 year old from Spelman College graduate from Spelman College, who watched President Obama's speech and said, I think President Obama said what so many of us feel. This is not the graduation that we imagined, but I felt like he offered the words I wanted to hold on to during this crisis. Following Ariel, we should ask think, what words, what stories do we want to hold on to during this crisis? Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and our discussion. <laughs>